Welcome to the Change the Game podcast, where we are changing the game by doing business differently. And we're highlighting stories of capitalism at its best. I'm Steve Baker, and with me is Rich Armstrong, president of The Great Game of Business and co-author of our new book, Get in the Game, How to Create Rapid Financial Results and Lasting Cultural Change. Hello, Rich. Hello, Steve. How are you? Well, I'm exceptional today because we have a very special guest. And frankly, if I was any better, I'd be twins. Today, we've got Vice President of Coaching at the Great Game of Business, Mr. Darren Bridges, or as we call him in the hallways around here, Mr. Michelle Bridges. Uh, Darren has an MBA from Drury University, and he's actually taught operations and marketing at both Drury University and Missouri State University. He's been an entrepreneur, an executive, a professor, a longtime veteran of SRC, and prior to joining us at Great Game, Darren spent 10 years as Vice President of Business Development at SRC Heavy Duty, the original living lab of the SRC family, and helped to grow it from $25 million in sales to $114 million in sales. So Darren, welcome, and thanks for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Uh, sure. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Rich. Um, you know, it's my, my involvement with Greg Game is interesting. I was a pre-med student at Drury, which is a local university. And I got basically uh, shamed into going and listening to some business guy speak uh, one night. And I did not want to go, stood in the back of the, uh, the room with my arms crossed, rolling my eyes, couldn't wait to get out of there. And by the time this gentleman finished, I had changed my major into business. Um, I grew up on doing uh, delivery, milk deliveries on a milk truck with my father. And I used to hear him talk about the business and management and them and seeing what he was going through. And I thought, man, there's no way I'm going to be spending my life doing what he does. But Jack Stack was a speaker that day or that evening. And he came in with a written speech, and I remember he tore it in half and just started talking to us about how business can be done differently. And this is back in the early days, back in the, the late 80s when I got to hear him. And he, uh, you know, he talked about how you can treat employees and how they can be uh, treated with an owner mentality, and how you can share with them and how you can value them and respect what they, uh, their knowledge. And quite frankly, changed everything for me. So that's awesome. From pre-med to business. I love that journey. I love that story. Um, let's get to it. We want to talk about three things that are keeping everybody up at night right now. Our listeners are thinking about talent, supply chain, and the ability to make money in this environment. Let's call them the three P's, people, parts, and profit. So if we start with people, everybody knows consumer spending is up, vaccin vaccination rates are climbing, uh, lockdown restrictions are easing, there's so much stimulus in the economy, and, and there are more job openings now than before the pandemic hit. It's crazy. I know right now at SRC, we have over 100 openings. So Darren, as you talk to clients, they're in just about every industry, every, every day you're, you're working with them. Um, are we feeling shortages across all industries or just specific ones? There are some pockets that are feeling it worse than others. Skilled labor specifically seems to be a big issue. And um, they are, uh, they, it is preventing them from growing. It's preventing them from filling uh, uh, orders. And some cl companies have backlogs that uh, go out you know, throughout the whole year because they just simply can't get the people to produce what they need. Darren, another thing that's, you know, in terms of people and just finding those skilled workers, there's been a lot of un unemployment fraud has become a big deal, right? I just, actually, I just heard this morning that Montana op is, is considering to opt out of the federal funds so that, they can keep their, their, the, the cost of those federal unemployment benefits down so they can get their people back to work. I think it is a really big, big, uh, big problem. And we're seeing that in a lot of industries, but people are setting up with interview appointments is what I understand is called ghosting, right? Interview appointments. 
just so they can get their three interviews in or their, their, their three applications in and get the employment, but they actually never show up for the interview. And I know we've struggled that with SRC. I know we've seen that in our area. Are you hearing that from the field as well? Have you seen that term being used or that, that issue being a problem? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's happening everywhere. And, uh, you know, you can't deny that it's not happening, but I still believe there are some people out there genuinely looking for work, who want to work, who want to work for a company, um, and it's trying to siphon through, you know, who are the real contenders and who are those just uh, checking a box so they can get that check from the government. Yeah, it's it's it. I know here at SRC, it's just been been crazy, and 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 how do we manage that? I heard recently that we talked to Jeff City, which is our capital, right? And 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 understanding what options do we have? I guess Missouri also has just um, put together where you can actually make a um, a claim, or basically, how do they put it? They they tie it to. Um, a report the employee work referrals refusals so if they can actually list it down and, and and submit to the to the state that these people actually applied we offered them a job and they refused the job um so how you know trying to trying to make sure that there's some accountability behind that process and it's just it's it i'm, I'm mentioning that only because it's really getting ugly it's getting so so hard to to get the right kind of people in there and uh and, but I don't understand, you know, I'm not sure how much that spills over to all the industries. And, and what you're saying is you're hearing some of that through your, your client interviews? Yeah, this week we had a workshop with a uh, group that uh, we'll just call them uh, advisors or skilled labor, you know, and such. And that basically what they provide uh, is their brain power. And they're a serious threat. It's not just finding. Uh, new people that are qualified for the job that can keep up with demand. It's keeping the people that they have right now. I, quick story, Rich, it's kind of interesting. Um, we, we had a construction company and they're desperately trying to differentiate themselves in the market. Uh, you know, you've seen with our clients, I think 18% of our clients last year were construction companies because of the boom. And the, you know, so everybody in construction is uh, up against this. And to, in, a, in, a, in an effort to separate themselves from the rest of the pack, they asked uh, for a logo that uh, brands them as a great game practitioner. And in, in, in the data supports that. In, I think in 2025, 75% of the workforce is going to be millennials. Mm. That group expects transparency. That group finds identity in themselves by who they work for. They want to work for something bigger than themselves. They're, it's not just a paycheck. They're not like their parents were, you know, just lucky to find a job. And quite frankly, they have that ability to choose right now. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, the biggest thing that's missing, though, is tying, tying it all together where an employer can show, yeah, we are about something bigger. We are about more than a paycheck. Not only are we going to be transparent, we're going to teach you what the financials mean and how you fit into that and be part of something that you can be proud of. And it was kind of exciting to see. So now we're, we're providing that to all our clients. And uh, we, we'll, we'll see what kind of success they have. No, I really like to hear that because it's uh, we, we can't talk about people without talking about engagement. And anybody that hears about engagement has heard the Gallup numbers, right? That over the last 10 years, they've averaged somewhere between 30 and 36 percent of American workers that are actually engaged in the job they do. Um, you know, uh, our team found another study, the Achievers Workforce Institute, that said 52 percent of people in a job right now are looking for another job. And, uh, you know, people don't feel as connected with their company. They, they say that 42% of people think their company culture has diminished since the start of the pandemic. And with that combination, I don't know, Darren, are you hearing things from, you know, clients and people in the great game community of how they're working to retain employees they already have? 
Yeah, you know, it's funny. I think a lot of them immediately go to the idea of money, financial rewards. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, that that does, you know, make somewhat of an impact. But if you believe in the Maslow hierarchy of needs, once you get past a certain point, it's got to be deeper than that. Quite frankly, you really skill people. And I'm not talking educated people. I'm talking about you've got a guy outside out there building engines and he's really good. It takes a lot of pride in building engines. Uh, that is a skilled labor. It's, it's, again, tying that in, but it can't be lip service. You can, you know, you can buy them lunches and you can do a lot of those kind of fun and entertain things. But if they feel like they are part of something and, and if they are truly seeing their impact on that business and they are engaging with a team or peers that they respect, that they enjoy working around, that's a, that's a lethal combination. And we have had multiple uh, companies, you know, first of all, during the pandemic, that said we wouldn't have made it without great game. And fortunately of all of our all-stars, only one company had a layoff, but they admitted to us, you know, look, we were probably going to have that layoff anyhow. It was uh, a publishing company and they had uh, there were two people laid off, I believe. The rest had zero. And now they're saying we are seeing greater retention. Now it's still something they have to keep it in forefront of the mind they have to be very deliberate about it but it's having those regular meetings going over how the company is performing how they can help but then also talking about look if we succeed we all succeed in some little way and i think in a lot of ways steve what i hear from our clients it's not just the money it is that feeling of winning you know, they're on a winning team. There's plenty of heartache in this world. Work is work, but when they feel like they're all part of something that they're, uh, you know, making a difference in and they're actually winning, that's a, a big psychological effect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, and Darren, just to, you know, echo what you're talking about in terms of having people enjoy the people that are around them, the work environments that's around them. I think, it was just the other night you and I were talking to a, you know, an employer employee that's within SRC and every question we would ask him about why he was considering to leave came back to, I want to enjoy the people that I'm around and that, and there's a challenge. And the, and the reason I want to set this up is that there was a challenge of that when you're trying to add people, right. And you're taking anybody you can get in your organization to help you manage, you know, the current demand that you have, sometimes you're bringing in people that don't necessarily fit your culture and it's hard to balance that. And it's just a shame. And, and how do you, how do you make, you know, maintain that? Um, and there's no secret. And, and, and this is the question I kind of have for you, Darren, is what you're seeing around with, with clients um, is that there's, you know, there's no secret that paying a lot of money is really the, the first method. A lot of people are doing signing bonuses, right? I heard the other day, and, and we've done some of this with some of our divisions, that if you had variable pay, like a bonus program, and let's say you're at 15% bonus payout as a typical benefit, they're saying, well, we'll just take 5% and pay it right up front. And now you have a 10% bonus just to just incentivize people to come on. And of course, there's referral bonuses and that sort of thing. But with mega, mega um employers like Amazon and Walmart hitting some of our small towns and fierce competitors armed with all the ideas of small, you know, sign on bonuses. How can small business attract people and still maintain profitability, sustained profitability? You know, I think that's what's risky is um, you see it with so many different things. Uh, this, this you, you see a scarcity, so you tend to overreact. And so they're driving up their wages. And once you get a wage up there, I, thought, I heard recently Target's paying 15 bucks an hour starting out. Um, once you get that up there, uh, trying to compete with that, man, you can't, it, you can't go backwards. And then what you're looking at is in, in order to stay profitable, you may have to make some really tough decisions on the amount of people you have, but you still may need those people, you know, those, those man hours to accomplish uh, what's needed for the business. It's a, it's a different world. I mean, SRC used to be able to attract 
every, tons of employees. We had a surplus of people that want to work for us just based on our reputation. And now you're seeing SRC because you have Amazons and so many of these big box places coming into our area. They're doing uh, billboards. They're doing TV commercials. They're, uh, they're uh, offering sign-on bonuses. They're offering referral bonuses help. They're even putting signs out in employees' yards. But I will say the best, and this is from personal experience, when I had my company, uh, Michelle and I had a distribution company. By far the best employees I ever found came from referrals. And I think a lot of it has to be do with being very deliberate. So we go, we, we, we have a lot of companies really hone in their sales pitch. They hone in, how do you go out and talk about the products or services we provide? What if they did the same thing with why do you want to come work for our company? What if they hone that in and help their employees be able to spread that word and talk to their friends and talk to their peer groups? What if you're speaking at different organizations, you know, that can tie in to the type of work that you do? And I think that uh, delivered approach can really help with those referrals, but you got to set your employees up. Another thing, Rich, that uh, SRC has been doing is making sure people understand the total benefit of working for a company that goes beyond just simply the, uh, the uh, pay rate. And that is what the benefits mean what kind of benefits are offered. The, uh, some companies I know like SRC offers uh, tuition reimbursement and you know, making sure with the 401k matching, making sure all those things are tied into that. The other thing I think is really important is talk about the culture, being able to be very specific and deliberate about what kind of culture that we have. Um, you know, Netflix has written a lot about this uh recently in two different books and what i love about netflix's hr principles are that you know essentially you've got to earn a right to work here you may get hired but we don't just keep everyone it's based on who you are there's a certain amount of pride that comes into that i know it sounds almost counterintuitive that you would challenge your employees when you're trying to keep you know keep uh, retention high but there's a certain amount of pride in them that I'm part of the winning team and being very blunt about the type of culture you have. Now, small businesses, you know, that like I had, we really played upon the fact that, yeah, we're a small company, but there's benefits in that. If you're a young person coming up in business, what better way to learn all the aspects of the business versus being pigeonholed inside one department and, be, be, and the type of exposure they can get. You just got to play to your strengths. But I do think there's something valuable of, as a business owner or maybe getting your team is simply asking a question. Why do you work here? Why do you stay? Why, why do you go out and promote ourselves? <laughs> that is awesome because sometimes you forget about it when you're working at an SRC company or a great game company. You do. You are challenged to be out of your comfort zone and to grow and become better. And <laughs> I remember uh, when Rich was interviewing me years ago. Um, I went to a friend of mine who was a business owner and, and they knew Jack. And I said, Hey, um, what do you think of SRC? You know, uh, I'm, I'm looking at maybe working over there. And they said, well, Steve, I don't know if you'd like it. It's a performance environment. <laughs> like, maybe I wasn't cut out for it. <laughs> so they, I must've slipped through the cracks. I don't know. How did, how did that affect you though? Did that challenge you? Or oh yeah. I, you? What do you mean? Of course I could do this, <laughs> but it also scared the shit out of me. <laughs> Isn't that cool? And then think about the alternative. If you would have said, well, I don't want to be held accountable. That's not the kind of employee you want. You exactly. know, I, I love that. I, that's a great story. Is it, it, makes you, it makes you so much more competitive in the marketplace because you're, you know, as Jack says, whoever has the dominant or the, the, the best workforce, the smartest, most engaged workforce will be the dominant company in the next 10 years. So that's very cool. I'm glad you brought it up. You know, I'll tell you one other thing that I've found with some of our clients that's attracting employees. We do high involvement planning. And that's all about painting that vision. Where are you guys, where you want to go as a company? What do you want to accomplish and how are you going to get there? Think about having that conversation with someone who may be interested in your company. 
versus just, okay, here's what's your pay rate, here's the hours, here's a break room, you know, and here's the job responsibilities. Think about that for a second. What you talk, here's our vision, here's where we're going, here's how we've been performing, and here's what we're going to do to get there, and here's the number of opportunities in front of us. That's a whole different conversation, man. Mm -hmm. Is it true? I heard a rumor that is it true that you were found by our president to come work at Great Game by beating out a 12 year old girl in a trivia game? Yes, I knew all the words to the uh, SpongeBob theme song, and I think Rich was very impressed by that. Um, I credit my children uh, with uh, with helping me uh, get this job. If I remember right, Darren, I think we were in a big labor crunch that time, too. So. <laughs> I was just trying to get some people in here. <laughs> yeah, when I first met Rich, he said, you know what my interview process is? And then he took my pulse. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know, did you gloat? Did you do a victory dance when you built, built beat oh, out? Oh, I, I crushed her. I crushed her. <laughs> it was merciless. But if you can't sing SpongeBob right, don't sing it. I knew he had a competitive drive in him, Darren, after I saw that. <laughs> it didn't matter who was in front of him. Ruthless. <laughs> Bowl him over. <laughs> All right. We got all good That's <laughs> good, though. This is why people listen to this podcast. So we talked about people. Let's, let's shift gears and go to uh, another one of the Ps. Let's talk about parts or supply chain. Uh, Darren, you're an expert in manufacturing, and you know the importance of a healthy supply chain. Right now, raw material, parts, shortages, it's all having a really big impact on trying to keep up with orders. Um, is there a hidden danger in the current state of supply chain? You know, like we've, we've heard this idea of uh, uh, a false economy from Jack. Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, you know, what, what is the, the lurking uh, thing in the darkness that's going to get us? And I hate that word expert, but I am so passionate about manufacturing operations. So if I geek out a little bit, forgive me. There's a term that we used to use in purchasing called the whiplash effect. So you go, you have a stock out, let's say when we were in distribution, I had our distribution company, you have a stock out. So you tend to not just buy based upon what you need or based upon what demand you've missed through backwards, you tend to overbuy. And you tend to get very emotional about your purchasing practices. Then when there's scarcity and you hear all this news, you tend to increase it that much more. And there is a real danger in this that, you know, there's this, there is definitely a, a tremendous growth in consumer buying and money cash is flowing free and people are getting excited and the you know, vaccines are hitting people getting out. And so there is this, this definite increase. Um, but you've got to keep your eyes on, it, you know, and, and so from a purchasing standpoint, talking to some of my friends who are still over at the SRC divisions, they're working with their suppliers directly. They're placing, uh, orders with the understanding we may push out due dates, but we're not going to cancel our orders to allow some flexibility, but to tie up, to help them tie up their uh, th their, their production so they know, you know, this is legit. I know that when I was, I worked for a large corporation, a Fortune 500 corporation, and we used to supply Winchester and Remington, all their shotgun shell wads. And the key to our success, we didn't have it in the beginning, was give, gaining their trust to share with us their, M back then we called them MRP reports, what they were producing, but that relationship was key, that data was key. How can you work with your suppliers? How can you work with your customers to have that data so that you, you're seen? At SRC, uh, the division I was with, we hired a lady full time and, and it sounded crazy, but all she did was continually look at our OEMs, um, we call them depots, distribution centers, and by part number, looked at what their stock on hand was by part number, knew from the OEM what their, their safety stock level should be, match our open orders against that, and then be able to predict their demand. That's all she really did. But that information was valuable for leveling out our production and scheduling, because quite frankly, remanufacturing is very manual intensive. 
and there's not a lot of automation. So trying to level out those schedules because the biggest, the other issue with this is you can end up running a tremendous amount of overtime. And although employees like it in the beginning, it, it gets, they just start to fatigue. But that relationship, man, if we have some SRC companies that are doing mini games, we have multiple SRC companies that are doing mini games right now with their customers in order to do like product launches with the customers. So the mini game, not only does the SRC people get rewarded, so do the, the customers people get rewarded based on product launches, based on on-time deliveries. They're even working with suppliers. In fact, we have one division that's giving away a car for a mini game. And it's a, it was a customer who's given it, but they realized that if we can get this amount of engines at this amount of time, the price of that car, which they're in the automotive industry, so it's not nearly as the expense as going out and buying one. It's is, a 97 Yugo, right? I doubt that. I hope not. But <laughs> it's a fraction. It's a fraction of it. But it makes a big statement, man. Think about it. You know, if you're an employee and you have a chance to win a car like that. That's awesome. I, I, my takeaway from that is uh, I, I heard you talk a lot about the relationship. Oh with your suppliers. And then the other part was you took it on proactively to actually, they, the supplier isn't uh, and the customer. So you're looking at both sides. You're saying, uh, I am going to predict your need even better than you can for us. That's pretty powerful. It, I, the other thing, Steve, is it totally, we talked a little bit about changing the conversation getting beyond just a service conversation, it totally changes the conversation that the companies are having with each other. Mm -hmm. They are talking about forward forecasting. They are talking about deeper issues than just, hey, I'm out of parts. You know, how come you guys can't ship me on time? They're talking about the problems and how to solve those problems together versus just taking an ass beating, you know, for, for not hitting the shipment on time. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, Darren, I don't know if it can be said enough. I, I really love what you're saying because people are making a lot of those decisions without that conversation and they're making it on fear or making it on, you know, misconceptions and that sort of thing. I know one of our sister companies had, are saying that the, the, the dealership inventory level is the highest they've seen in years, but they're making those decisions in isolation, right? Just to save... Yeah. You know, just because they, and I just love that point you're making, Darren, is that find a way to connect your supply chain together from end to end on a communication, how we can work through this together, not just trying to cover each other's, you know, back. And man, that's, that's great advice for people. I know I'm harping on high involvement planning, but when I was at SRC, you know, we did it twice a year, every year. It's a big deal for us. And we're always looking at the market indicators uh, and the economic forecast. And we're reaching out and talking to our customers to understand what the market's saying. But if you think about that, that, uh, that supply chain and where you're at in that, the closer you can get to the customer, the better. And so, for instance, with SRC, we sell to OEMs. But the more we could talk to the fleets, to the dealerships, to the people on the front lines, the better we were at predicting what was really going to happen. And, I, you know, I, I attribute that to the high involvement planning process. That we, it was not something that came naturally for us, mm -hmm. but it, it does make a tremendous impact. And then you can share a lot of that information with those people in the middle that may not even be as knowledgeable. And all of a sudden now you're resourced to them. You know, you're, you're coming in with information that they can do their job better. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's sh shift gears just a little bit further, Darren. Um, we just held our semi-annual coaching summit uh, last week. And part of that summit, your agenda focused on referral programs. And one of our great game coaches, Dave Skelton, who uh, has a knack for referrals, had shared uh, um, and really facilitated the whole group on what running effective referral programs. What were some of the key takeaways that you came from that conversation, you, you saw from that conversation, Darren, and maybe how business leaders and in other industries and things like that could utilize some of these ideas? You bet. You know, I think the it's, I'm going to sound kind of like a broken record, and I swear this wasn't intended, but what 
Dave's process is uh, a lot of coaches that go in, they help out, and they may have some type of relationship, you know, usually a close relationship with the CEO. Dave takes it a step further. He's extremely deliberate. He talks to that CEO or that president every week, even if it's for 10, 15 minutes, just to give him an update. And he said, what happens is usually they keep him on the phone quite a bit longer and they get to know each other personally. He develops that relationship with them. They, you know, they go beyond just client coach to friends. He also is deliberate about setting up a relationship with the person who's the head of sales, the person who's the head of HR, and they has a similar type of conversations with them. Maybe not as often, maybe not weekly. Maybe it's at least, you know, every other week, once a month, but he's very deliberate in the way that he does, does that uh, process. And in return, they start to realize what kind of an impact he's making, how much he cares, how knowledgeable he is, and how can they not refer him. A lot of the other coaches also get, you know, a tremendous amount of referrals. And, but again, they seek them out. And they know exactly, they, they know exactly the ask of what they're asking for. Mm -hmm. And they also realize that they get about equal as much as they give. So when you show up with a client and you're asking them, you know, if you know of anyone that might be interested, being a little more specific. If you know of someone who's in this industry, are you part of an organization already, like a, a, a peer group or a Vistage group or something like that, that you find would benefit from this and then making it easy on them, providing them the book or the business card or the link that all, they don't have to do a tremendous amount of work, they, but they have that path in place. It's very, it's, it's proactive. They've thought it through ahead of time and it's, some, it's somewhat strategic in the way they go about it. It's not just an afterthought. Does that answer your question, Rich? Yeah, I think so. I think very much so. I think it's just a, another way of what what you can it, it, you never really can underestimate the power of referrals and i've always felt like that measurement also is a great measurement on the quality and i think that's what oh, you're yeah. pointing out is that that it's an ultimate measure of just how well you are servicing the client one of the things i do remember from the conversation is the balance of your serving versus asking for the referral right is that yeah. Um, don't get in the trap of asking too quick and, and, until you've really served them and provided the necessary value um, back to them. You know, it's one story. Uh, Mr. Stoltz was working with a very large company in Australia this year. And this company hired Great Gain uh, for one specific reason, was to increase the overall value of the company. It was beyond just profits, beyond just, you know, the culture and the employee retention. They wanted to increase the value of their company. And they were quite skeptical in the beginning. They blew it out of the water. I mean, just absolutely blew it out of the water. And that comes into the quality. That one guy was responsible for getting Dave five new clients. One guy. But that's that is the price of referral. And don't get me wrong, you can go out and you can do all the marketing, you can do all those kind of things to bring in new clients. But when you've got a trusted advisor telling you, hey, there's this guy named Dave Sculpey. He's a coach for the great game business. You need to talk to him. He made a tremendous impact on my business. Here's how you can reach him. That, that's, you know, that, that bypasses a lot of that grunt work that you have to do on the front end. Yeah, it's golden. It is. Referrals are amazing. So that's that's one strategy to uh, uh, if we're talking about profits, you know, how am I going to drive profitability? Well, I don't think you can do better than a referral uh, for good business. Um, do you think let's go to pricing? Do you think that business owners should be raising prices right now? Hell yes. <laughs> but how do you really feel? Absolutely. And, you know, we always had kind of a saying at SRC, when the economy goes down, it's not the time to be asked for price increases. You got to do it while the economy is going up. Everybody knows costs are going up. This is where it comes. The, the 
the whole idea of engaging your employees in the business, in the finances, and taking ownership of what they do is so important because costs are creeping up everywhere. There's surcharges. I mean, you we've heard the horror stories about the price of lumber. You've got to stay on top of it. And one man, one owner, one business leader can't do it all. How do you get your people to proactively, constantly looking at that and then realizing, okay, we take we we kept we kept our costs as low as we can. Now we've got to go after the price increase. We must protect our margins so that we can continue to fund the growth, fund the people, fund the retention, and all these other things. And that I truly believe is one of the biggest benefits that we're seeing right now with a lot of our clients is that they have that insight, they have that view of what's going on with their costs and what's going on with uh, where prices need to be increased. And again, I know it's a difficult conversation, but think about it. If you can develop that type of relationship with your clients and you can give them a logical explanation, you get that again, it's, it's that conversation of going deeper. Here's what we're dealing with. Most business people are going to understand that. And then working with them on the timing, that, that's the key. Just nobody likes surprises. You, and that's where that forward forecasting, forward thinking comes in. Don't surprise them. Give them some lead time so they can expect it and get it passed through their price increases as well. But it, it's interesting. I know, you know, last year at our conference, uh, we had a gentleman that came on and we talked about inflation. And at that time, we hadn't seen inflation in, you know, 20 plus years. It is, it, you're hearing a lot more talk about inflation right now. And you've got to stay on top of it. Darren, we always like to wrap up these episodes by asking this question. So what question should we be asking you? What have we missed? Oh, you know, Rich, I, so I gave at the beginning the story about how I got acquainted with Jack Stack, great game, changed my career. I worked around, you know, I'm from Springfield, Missouri. I was around great game. It seemed like all the time, not directly, but with companies or, you know, hearing about what was going on. We had our company and I tried to implement great game on my own and created the greatest entitlement program you've ever seen. I valued my people and I was paying them uh, some type of a game share each quarter, but I was not open transparent with our financials because quite frankly i was heavily le leveraged it was a startup company i was not teaching them how we made money because i just wanted to sell and ship every day i didn't want to tie up their time learning how we made money and so you know they were getting checks from me but they didn't know how they didn't know why they were just getting money and it, it basically became an entitlement program then you know i was at src and i definitely saw the benefit of the game, but it wasn't until I came over here and then I see our, our practitioners, the clients that we have. It's, it's, and I mean this in all sincerity. So I've been, you know, a great game just over a little, a little over a year. It's incredible to me, the impact it makes. And I'm, I'm not trying to tell any of the listeners, they're probably all know this already, but that value of educating, empowering, and engaging your employees. It, it, is, it is a differentiator for you as a company that you can market and become a workplace of choice. Put that great game practitioner logo out there and let people know the value of working for your company. And I feel you know, somewhat uh, guilty of talking a lot about SRC. It doesn't have to be a big company to get that kind of benefit. We have a, a landscaping company that we work with, and you know we talk about building those relationships and such. And they they proudly let everybody know the guys that are taking care of your lawn have the ownership mentality. They may not have the equity, but they have that ownership. They take they have a piece, they have a, a, a stake in this company. It's not just a paid job for them. That's you know that's a differentiator among all the other landscapers out there. So. I think if, if I was going to summarize, wrap it up, that, that educate, empower, and engage, man, it, it, it is a defining factor. And sometimes it seems like, especially when you're in the heat of battle, it's, it's hard to do. But if you can set up that deliberate process, it will make a difference. I think that's a tremendous example, Darren, because I, I just think about no matter what it is, 
if the guy changing my oil or setting my landscaping or anything um, knows the, how the business runs, I'm just going to feel like they're just going to do the job a little bit better. You know, that's awesome. Like I'm working with the owner. Mm -hmm. Well, Darren, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. I know you really should be working with the coaches right now, but thank you for being lax in your duties enough to be a part of our little show here. And thanks so much for your insights. You're awesome. Well, let's keep the conversation going. Send us your questions, your stories, your best practices, ideas, challenges, and victories. That is capitalism at its best. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.